uh, not just yet, <laughs> maybe a bit later. <coughs> And you're recording, Ben, yeah, you are. Okay. Oh, yeah, I just turned on the recording about a minute ago. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know how many people are actually going to show up, so maybe it's just the panelists. Yeah, well, let's, uh, whatever we get started, Ben, I think, um, you know, we, it's going to be recorded anyway, and as people join in, they can pick up, but I think uh, it's probably a waste of everybody's time. Let's, uh, let's get going. All right, um, well, first of all, welcome to both uh, Tina and Yerke uh, for joining us. Um, and very simply, this is a, uh, a, an interview, question and answer, town hall um, set up for everybody to uh, get to know our presidential candidates a little bit better. Uh, the AGM is on the 7th of October, I believe, Ben, and voting will open a couple of days before that. Um, we're gonna ask both Tina and uh, Yerke, uh, some questions, just which are standard questions, just so that you get a sense of who they are, what their background is, and what they stand for. Um, and so that should be able to inform you in terms of the vote uh, that comes up in a few weeks' time. Um, and this will be recorded and we'll be sharing it on the class website, uh, social media channels, uh, just so that it reaches the widest uh, audience possible. And yeah, so what I'm proposing is that uh, we have collated some questions that came in from some of the, of the sailors. We've come up with some of the questions ourselves just based on, um, you know, what we know about the class and what we think is relevant for, for you guys to address. Uh, and so what I'm going to propose is that Ben act as moderator, uh, that he basically will ask each, both you, Tina and Yerke, uh, questions and then uh, I think what we'll do is we'll start off with Tina being the woman and then rotate. So Tina will answer, JJ will answer, and then the next question, JJ will answer, Tina will answer. And it's really, you know, it's not, it's just to get some sense of who you are, what you think. Um, and I think that would be, we'll give people a good indication at the moment. I think we have about 10 questions, Ben, maybe 11. Uh, and so we'll try and keep this to, you know, we thought about 30 to 45 minutes, but it might run longer depending on, you know, if people have specific questions and so forth. So Ben, over to you. I'll be on mute and uh, just be listening in. Yeah, thanks, Marcus. And uh, thanks to everyone who's joined us. Um, I think we're really lucky to have uh, two people willing to put so much uh, work in to, uh, to, to running our class for the future. So, um, you know, it's really a strong sign for the class. Um, so we're gonna ask the same questions to each candidate, give them each a chance to respond. And, uh, and we'll go through some questions. If I can ask everyone to go put themselves on mute, um, and then if you have a question, you can raise your hand and, and we'll let you ask. So um, I've got the first two questions ready. We'll, we'll just get things rolling. And then if you would like to ask a question, we'd actually prefer um, that, uh, that the membership and the World Council members ask their own questions, uh, and then we have some backup questions. So don't, uh, don't be shy if you have a question to ask, and, uh, and we'll get straight into it. Okay. So Tina, um, can you please introduce yourself to us and uh, let us know a little bit more about your, uh, your background and, and how it relates to sailing and, and running an organization like the 49er class? Well, um, yeah, my name is Tina, even though I guess I go by Bettina on Zoom. <laughs> um, as, I, as I mentioned in my brief bio earlier, my written one is that I, uh, I grew up in Toronto and I sailing dinghies. And then I took a bit of a pause and went into windsurfing as well as into the windsurfing industry. And, uh, and then when 49ers came around, I, uh, I thought, hey, this is like a, a windsurfer that's become a dinghy. <laughs> and I think that interested both me and my husband, Trevor. And we got one of the, the earlier ones that had come to uh, North America. And at that time we were living um, in the Columbia River Gorge. And so um, we started uh, sailing it and with the idea of doing some of the racing that was starting to, to develop in the U.S. at the time, led by the McKees and uh, Carl Bucken <clears throat> and Morgan Larson. And it was quite an exciting time to sail 49ers. And there was a lot of moving parts. The equipment was 
kind of being developed. The, Na the NACRA, what's going on in the NACRA right now is kind of seems uh, reminiscent of what was going on. I'm sure your Keith could agree with that. There was a lot of changes. And um, so there was equipment stuff. There was also the, the class becoming a, an Olympic class. And, and, then, uh, and then there was also just uh, the, uh, the venues and the excitement around where we were going to compete and how, how, how we were going to make sure that, that uh, the sailing, uh, Olympic sailing could, could make it, uh, could, 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 could kind of embrace us because we weren't really able to go out um, and sail uh, like three hours away uh, <laughs> from the beach. So there were all sorts of exciting things and I found it uh, really interesting, a, a lot of it, a, a big challenge, but um, it, was, it was a great thing to do. And um, then after I, I, I sailed them for about four years and then uh, raced them for about four years and then uh, put sailing on hold to, to have kids. And then kind of had a, a last blast in the International 14, which is like a, well, the way we ended up designing our 14, it was like my dream boat. <laughs> all of a sudden, all the things that uh, you couldn't do in a one design class, we could do, um, or at least in a, in a strict one design, and um, in a development class. And, 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 then, uh, and then I kind of moved on, partly because it, it's really challenging to uh, be a parent at the same time as uh, not impossible by any means, but for me, it was really challenging to do that and, and, to, and to also sail primarily with my husband, which is, makes it, you know, you're both away all at the same time. So <laughs> anyway, and so that's my sailing back, my personal experience with the 49er. And I have to say that I, 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 I've missed it because I, I, the idea of, of going out and hiking on something like a small dinghy around where I live now, we live now in Santa Cruz, California, um, or a, or a, um, or a small, uh, a small keel boat is just not that exciting compared to what you can do on a, on a dual, double trapeze boat. And then there's all the other kinds of boats that are even more exciting now. So um, that's, that's that stuff. But as far as my comp, my experience and what I think I could bring to the class outside of, outside of specifically being a racer, which I think is one of the key, it is really important is, um, that I was involved in, um, in things like the, the uh, in Industries Association for Windsurfing. I've been involved in finance committees for, for different kinds of organizations. So I understand, you know, um, some of the, the, uh, the financial aspects and some of the, just the politics behind um, a sport as well as just behind any organization as, and, and, and the importance of running um, a financially viable ship. And um, so with those kinds of experiences, um, and I, I also think that uh, the last, lastly, um, I, I, the combination of that and having, and, and being a, uh, aware of what, it, what we need as a class in general, not necessarily with any kind of sense of an agenda of my own, but with an idea that I think that it's very important that the equipment always be uh, dependable and um, consistent, as well as as high quality as possible, which is an ongoing, an ongoing endeavor. And then uh, making sure we have venues that work for our class uh, so that the racing, which is what most Olympic sailors or most, most competitors in sailing are, are really interested in, um, is, are, are, are good uh, and, and, and showcase um, what we need to for as comp competitively. And then uh, thirdly, it's, it's always about also um, making sure that our class um, is healthy and, and that we are a very much part of the Olympic uh, family because that's where we wanna be right now. And uh, it's worked very well for us. And it's also made, I think, a whole host of sailors that go beyond the Olympics, um, very able to, um, to stretch their limits. And I think that's a great thing to bring to sailing. Thanks, Dina. Yeah. Thanks. Um, uh -huh. AJ, if you can uh, let us know yeah. a little bit about your background um, and, uh, and your skills and whatnot. Uh, that relate to the 49er sailing and the 49er class. Thanks. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Jyrki, Jyrki Ervin. Most of the sailors call me just JJ because the <laughs> Finnish names are a bit difficult. And yeah, my background is mainly in uh, for 70 class, but I sail many dinghies and many classes 
over the years. I'm 54 years old and uh, uh, my maybe uh, biggest um, achievements has been uh, probably 470 class, Europe Dinky top 10s in the world, 50 in the world in uh, 470, 1990. And uh, then I, but I've been also always interested in many different classes and, and technical side of, of the, my, my education is I'm a naval architect from uh, Technical University of Helsinki. And uh, I started sailing because I, I was interested in technical things and designing the boats. And I uh, just grew up in a uh, sort of drifted away from technical side and become a sailor. <laughs> and uh, um, then in 1990s, uh, I was actually thinking about sailing 18 foot skiffs in, uh, in Sydney. And then I, I wanted to meet uh, some of the 18 foot skiff sailors and I bumped up in uh, with Julian Bertwhite and maybe that was maybe 1995. He showed me uh, drawings of 49er, 19, 1995, oh, yes. And he said that uh, forget the 18 foot skiff and this will be the next big thing. Uh, so we, instead of having an 18 foot campaign from Finland, to Australia, we started uh, building up the 49er Grand Prix and we put some Finnish sailors together, like experienced for uh, dinghy sailors and uh, build it, uh, we, we built up the class in Finland. And uh, uh, so I was boat sailing and running the 49er Grand Prix for, for many years. And even I, uh, we, with Thomas Johansson, we had a four years campaign for Sydney and we, we won the goal, but uh, after that, I continued promoting the class in, in Finland and Scandinavia. And um, yeah, and uh, I, yeah, I've been also, also over those years, I, I was involved in the 49 class. I was in, uh, in the class. Um, I think it was how it was organized early days. I think it was like I was a uh, vice president or something like that. I, it was a little, a little bit differently organized the class in early days, but uh, the, we had a board. And uh, I think I was a board member in uh, 1998 to 2000, I think. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's my background in the 49er and skip sailing and, and, and sailing. And nowadays I've been coaching uh, uh, my recent jobs has been Asia, like Japan, India, and China. Those are the areas where the skiff sailing and uh, 49 sailing has been growing or expanding. But, so they have expanding markets. I, I think uh, Tina followed on with her question and, and talked about what she thought uh, the three areas of focus should be for the class. So would you mind continuing on uh, on with that, Yuki? Thanks. Yeah. The, the, uh, I feel that the developing a class is the classes we, we are not as as class is like a platform the sa for the sailors and so we have to provide as a, as a foreign on a class as as good as possible the platform for the sailors and sailors are the bringing the medals and fame and and uh, I think that's that's really important to remember that uh, that uh, we are we are organizers of worlds and Europeans and and uh, and the class is organizing media and, and, and publicity, many, many of these things, and also governing the uh, rules and technical things. So that it's, it's, uh, it's like a, a service organized organization for the sailors. We are not uh, like a running the show. We, we, are, we are providing a good platform for the top sailors so that they can grow up and uh, continue the professional sailing or, or them whatever, or, the, or the, taking the Olympic medals and become a big, uh, like a heroes, like uh, Peter Burlingham, they took. So that's the main job as, as the class, I feel. And, uh, and secondly, I think it's important to um, uh, strengthen the relationship between the sailors and, and the class and, and the main stakeholders like uh, the designer, uh, Julian Brett White and, and the builders, and of course the world sailing and and other 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 and the countries 
class association, local national class association. So putting that all those different parties together and, and, and strengthening the, the relationship be, between them. So that's the main, maybe the second point of, and then the third, third one, I would say that the, the technical side of governing the technical rules and making sure that uh, we have uh, equal equipment and, uh, and the prices and the service of the, of the builders uh, is, is good for the, for the sailors and so that uh, we can concentrate, or, or not we, but <laughs> I, mean, I, I still talk like a sailor, but uh, uh, so that the sailors, they can concentrate of, the, of their own projects and taking the medals and uh, becoming a great sailor. So that, that's, so it's, it's uh, like a, working together with the builders class good platform. Thanks very much. Um, You're welcome. Does that, so if anyone from the audience has a question, uh, I think there's a raise hand icon you can use and hopefully I'll spot that or, um, or you can jump in. In the meantime, I've uh, got another question that, uh, that I can add in them. I guess we'll start with uh, Yerky this time. Um, Yerky, what kind of uh, time and effort availability um, are, are you able to make to being the president of the 49er class uh, in terms of the other aspects of your life? Um, I'm, the past years I've been coaching different countries and I, I'll, I'll be coming for the ma major events anyway. So I'm, I'm, I, I believe that I can commit um, pretty much for the, for, the, for the class as well. And I, I, I mean, it comes, I, I believe that for me, it comes quite naturally, like uh, whenever, the, even I don't know, over those years, I, I haven't always been involved in the class, but I just tend to make a discussions with the, with the, with the class people and measurement people. I, I, I like to know them. So it's, it, it has been always natural side of me to, so that I, 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 I like to be close to the, close to the people who are governing the class, and it's um, so. When I when I heard that the Forty Nine class needs a new president, I thought that the, why not I could give back something what I have got from the class. So I, I think it's 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 important for me that the class is well, it's managed well, and it's it's and class class is doing well. Thanks. And Tina, same question to you. What, what kind of time and effort availability do you have for the class? Well, I think I have uh, plenty of availability. My, uh, I work uh, in investing. I manage um, uh, an investment partnership. And that is not a full-time job, though it's sometimes very stressful. It's not particularly um, more than, I don't know, half time, I would say. Um, and uh, I also... Um, have uh, my family commitments are reducing just because my children are all both going to be in college next year. And um, even though college might be involve being at home these days, <laughs> but anyway, um, it's not like I have toddlers. Um, and uh, then otherwise, I'm also, it, it, sailing has always been an important part of my life. The ocean's always been an important part of my life. And I really uh, think it's important to give back uh, at some time in your life, you're more available than others. And this is definitely a time when I am as, as well as I think it's a time when there's a lot of changes going on in the world. And I think being able to be um, involved in a, uh, a, a world organization, even if it is, you know, a very specific uh, 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 purpose is also a, a really good thing for humanity and for me, <laughs> because it's good to get to know people who aren't necessarily in the same um, nation as you right now. And I know maybe those of you in Europe haven't been quite as locked down as, as Americans might feel, but um, I live in the United States right now, even though I'm Canadian, I can't even go to Canada. <laughs> so I know that'll go away, but there's still this real feeling that we need to keep um, a global perspective. And I think, uh, 49er uh, class and all the Olympic classes, even the Olympic ideals are very much something that we need to protect. So I feel very engaged in that kind of thing. And I have very much. plenty of time to put to it. Um, 
Okay, next question, uh, first to you, Tina. Um, we've been trying to improve our initiative towards uh, new sailors to the class. Things like the Junior World Championships have become an important championship in recent years, uh, the U23 Championship. Um, what do you think can be done to help incoming sailors to the class? Well, this is always a hard one because um, it's very specific to the nation you're living in and, and even the region. So I think it can't, there can't be a, a, a one size fits all uh, uh, really answer to that. Though I do think um, being able to understand what the challenges are in different parts of the world mm -hmm. and, uh, and making sure you, you get involved at that level. Um, I think uh, I've always felt that one of the main things that differentiates people who can compete at an elite level in sailing and, and, and stay at it um, and, and have, a, have a certain amount of success is, is information. And uh, it, it goes, kind of goes against the whole idea of competition to give out information. But I think there's a certain level at which if you expect to have any competitors, you can't you can't have all the information in one place. And if you expect to be an Olympic class, uh, which includes, inc uh, yeah, this is all driving from, you know, in in incre increasing the amount of juniors and, and youth that come into the, the class, you, you can't really do it unless um, you, you have a certain amount of, of communication and, um, and not always competing. So yes, <sighs> I, I think those kinds of initiatives where you're, you're realizing what the challenges are in each area and, and, and not trying to make it a sport that only really works in a couple of countries or even on, you know, on one continent more than others, even though those might be the best places to do it. And um, I think that's, that's a key, but I, I really, I feel like there's a, a, a lot of value to just listening to what, um, what comes up and making sure that as, as I, as I, I think one of my strengths is, is to figure out more as, as you keep going and not come up with a plan right now, like right sitting here right now, I don't have a, a, a clear plan, but I'm sure there's a lot of things that have been tried and, and some things that have worked better than others. So. Thank you very much. Uh, JJ, same question to you. Um, uh, what kind of initiatives do you think are available to help our transitioning sailors into the class? Yes. Um... Yes, uh, uh, grandfathering the old equipment is important, and keeping the rules quite open for the for the both FX and 49 and on a national level, on an international level, they must be more strict. But of course, in, on a national level, you can have a different kind of combinations and and and, and sailing with different kind of equipment, and it doesn't have to be so strict. So and and. Uh, but then on international level, it's of course that have a good events. So that so with, with the top sailors and, and and coming sailors can meet on the international level and, and that, that's that's really important. What we have been doing with the Europeans and girls is 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 just absolutely great. Like uh, we have a really nice two fleets, FX and 49ers, and, and we get quite quite big fleets in the in a major events and people can meet, but but on the same time it's it's many of some of the 14, some of the Olympic classes are coming um, just very very uh, international and no national fleets at all. I, I don't want to mention any other other classes, but it's keeping the national fleets. It's it's just so important for the for the local sailors and. Uh, as, as Tina said, that it's varies from country to country how to do it, but uh, but uh, um, to to encourage the national like uh, uh, fleets where where the all ages can sail. It's not only about the youngsters, but if you have uh, some uh, guys who have been uh, sailing 49 like uh, <laughs> some years ago, it's it's great to have them uh, back in doing the nationals. Like and, and to get a good fleet in in the, in the home, home country, so that uh, those this kind of any means to have a good fleet nationally, it's important. And uh, I, that's that was the one of the, uh, I think one of the uh, main things when we were running the the Finnish 49er Grand Prix that uh, we had a had a good fleets and good events in 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 Finland and in Baltic countries and, and Scandinavia. 
and and that that was also I think afterwards thinking uh, also big backbone of Thomas and my my success doing well in Sydney Olympics and and uh, sort of surprising the Aussies <laughs> and others so that we had a had a great fleet back home in Finland and and they were they were really tough guys to beat and that's 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 I think it's a good learning for the many other countries as well that don't forget uh, your home fleet. Thanks very much. Again, if, um, I'm just going to let someone else in. Um, if uh, people have a question they want to ask from the floor, just raise your hand and I'll uh, let you uh, ask it. Um, uh, Yerke, um what would your approach be to um, a major events like the World Championships? How would you look at balancing the different um, things that we look for, like event budgets from the host, cost of competing, geography, amenities for the sailors, logistics? What's your approach to our major championships in that way? I think it's uh, the, 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 the current idea to bundle up with them. Uh, FX 49 is it's of course that's a no-brainer that's that's a good fleet but also to have an across together we have uh, three classes which are racing about the you know, same size of courses and tip, same type of racing so I think it's a good combination and and if possible we, we should definitely continue doing that and um, uh, Personally, I've been a bit skeptical about bundling all the worlds, all, all the Olympic classes together. Like, but that's world sailing decision. But uh, I think our our setup having three worlds or three Europeans say, together, it's like a good combination. It's it's um, creates a, a bit of a mass and and uh, economics of mass. But it's not too hard to. To, to manage like it's it comes just too hard to have a 10, 10 classes together my experience what I have seen and uh, just concentrate on doing the good media job it's especially what we saw in New Zealand Auckland that was great that was like uh, absolutely fantastic if we can if can if we can repeat that we are fine and uh, and uh, back in the days when I started, TV was very important. Now it's internet, and uh, how to how to how to reach uh, audience in the internet is it's a bit different. And, and but uh, we should have a good tools to do that, and just maintaining the good job and uh, not uh, not doing any big mistakes or risk with uh, economic uh, economically. Like I think. I understood that the class has pretty good situation with money wise so we should uh, and also we have a good situation in a, uh, as as an Olympic class so we should uh, we should sort of maintain that thanks very much Tina same question to you um, what what type of approach would you take towards our major uh, events um, balancing the different things like uh, like the budgets the events can put forward, cost, geography, amenities for the sailors, logistics, or anything else? Uh... Well, I think that um, I agree with what Yerke is saying regarding uh, that it seems to work to have three worlds together, the FX, the 49er, and the, and the NACRA, uh, because it's large enough to, to make a real impact without being un, very difficult or so difficult to manage and, and, and resources at all levels from the local, actually local volunteers, which is really often key to, uh, to, to sailboat racing, even at the world level in Olympic classes. Um, so there's that. And I also agree that the sailing World Cups are, are often hard to, um, those are harder to manage. Um, for for every, for the happiness of every class, just because they it's a lot of boats in one place, and you do a lot of uh, the logistics get somewhat overwhelming. So I think there was the class's current response has been as far as from my, what I understand is and I experienced this last year when I was visiting was uh, the um, you make it so that the uh, you plan 
your the world the worlds ahead of time so that everyone you, you do it the timeline in which you plan and dedicate and and sign contracts for 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 these uh, three worlds together uh, is um, is done in such a way that pe the logistics are more manageable the finances are known and I think that making sure that um, as much as possible in a changing world that we can uh, that we can. Uh, reduce the chance or increase the chances of successful events at, and by doing that kind of planning, advanced planning. And uh, that, that uh, obviously has kind of been set on its ear this year. <laughs> um, I think that the, the media is always a challenge with sail, sailboat racing, but I think um, I, was, I was super impressed that what, what was going on in Auckland. And I even thought that what you guys, um, in, in Geelong, I thought it was still pretty, it, it's amazing to me what you can do with a video camera and the internet to get people to feel like they're really there um, at an event. And we're all old enough, I think, to, uh, to know, realize that that's kind of cool because we didn't grow up with it. We didn't grow up with an iPhone in our pocket and, uh, or whatever kind of uh, Nokia in our pocket or something. <laughs> anyway, so there's that. And then I, I think that um, budget wise, I think it's always important to make sure that you're prudent enough without, without, uh, without not be, you have to be willing to take some risks, but, 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 but take um, with ca calculated risks. And I think that's, that's something that I, I've learned very much in the rest of my life. But every every competitor, every sailing competitor, especially, I mean, sailboat racing is all about calculated risk. And um, and then it's an open event, so you know you never know what's going to hit you. And this year has really shown us that in in the rest of our lives. So I think that um, those are key. And I think we've I think the class has done a pretty good job so far with those things. So I I. I I think that's why you're in a pretty strong position at this point. Thanks. Um, again, if you want to raise your hand and ask a question from the floor, go ahead. Otherwise, I'll, I'll keep on going here. This one might be a little too narrow, so hopefully I don't trip anyone up on it or anything. But um, world sailing has been uh, increasingly uh, looking to impose policies they call FRAN, so fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory non towards our technical equipment. So they're looking to um, sort of enforce more standards about who can bid for equipment and, um, and how that uh, gets implemented. Uh, we have a, um, um, a manufacturer, One Design, and, uh, and um, you know, <laughs> I hope I can ask this properly, but what would be your approach um, to ensuring we comply with the, like the FRAN policies World Sailing is insisting on while we also, um, uh, you know, manage our, our current framework as a as a manufacturer supply uh, one design. Uh, and Tina, over to you. So hopefully, I haven't uh, made that too narrow. <laughs> well, you know, I think there's some very specific answers that you could have if you uh, to this question if you were one of our manufacturers. Um, I'm not one of them, but I have been a manufacturer of sporting goods equipment, and so I understand that there's always this the realities of what can you manufacture for what cost. I mean, because uh, you know everyone does. I mean, in our it's less transparent, I think in an Olympic class, who's actually making money off of the equipment, you know, how much of a royalty there is for who and, and whatever and, and where the margins are. But in, in the, at the end of the day, you know, it, it, you, cannot, um, you cannot expect a supplier to be reliable if, if they are not making enough money to be reliable. And it doesn't mean they have to be um, making a fortune, but I don't think anybody who goes into making things for, for dinghies even you know, one design Olympic classes makes a fortune. So I think there's that. There's always the, uh, the there's always a tension between um, making sure that the the equipment is uh, uh, is fair, reasonable, non discriminatory as far as who gets to make it, but also making sure that at the same time you, you, the the equipment is actually. Uh, good and, and, and can work and and the, the and the manufacturer it can and whatever the supply chain is is reliable because reliability is is also very much important to the sailors and it should be because you, you can't at reliability and fairness really of 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 not of the equipment um it has to be can't be different too different the, the tolerances are always going to uh, are always going to be there's going to be a spec and there's always going to be a variation but it has to be should be as little as small as possible otherwise it isn't one design 
and and that that's you can't expect perfection but you can try for it um and so i think that is um the approach i would take is that uh you do what you need to do to follow the rules of uh that are coming down on for for this on this focus of on on on, on increasing the amount of, I guess, competitive, uh, from what I understand, it's who, who can manufacture for the class, but you also have to come in with all the experience of the class in, in what it takes to actually um, to deliver reliable, um, equ at, at a high performance equipment that is fair. And I know Yerke your, your mentioned this earlier, and it's really important that it be as fair as possible. And fairness means the stuff does not, you don't have to, because there's all these things that go around in a class when you think that one manufacturer is going to do better than another, <laughs> and it and it totally breaks down the whole supply chain to the sailor. So that's Thanks, where Brad. I would come from. Yeah, you did well with that, um, given my muddled question asking of it. Um, Yerke, um, uh, similar same question to you. Um, uh, the the world sailing is you know, putting an increasing process or focus on on the technical side of things. Uh, how, how would your approach be while balancing um, how the class has been? Yes, uh, yes. Then I follow the question, uh, the, the case. Uh, I, I think it's a, it's it's a, a political case from Finbingi and and some other classes like a, against the monopoly classes. And and I I, I feel that the, our situation as a, as a, uh, several builders and and, uh, and we shouldn't we should be quite far in this case. It's it's more more I guess like a finding against laser and and uh, uh, single manufacturer class like we are not the single manufacturer class so I, I think um, but of course we are single manufacturer in the sales and the rigs but um, uh, on on the other hand we are doing pretty good job compared to like a laser laser sales and and the rigs are far less uh, long-standing than our rigs and sales. So that, of course, we have had a bit more expensive, but we are not changing the top mast after every every regatta. Like uh, uh, Peter and Blair, they sail, um, I think they, they and, and Nathan Otrich, they were both sailing like uh, rigs from, was it, correct me if I'm right, but they, they, they sell many years with the rigs with the, Built in 2011 or something like that, so they 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 are our rigs are really long lasting. So and uh, so the the main concept is is as a class and and the builders is is pretty fair, but it's it's not only the concept and and the builders and the rules. It's the boat builders are like they are human as well, and it's it's very much about talking with them and 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 the designer julian and and the boat builders and sailmakers rig manufacturers we we just i think it's continuously have to keep contact with them and and uh, talking and, and southern bar spas did a great, great job with the carbon rig and now they are giving a quite nice handover to the new builder so the it's um, we just have to keep good relationship with the builders, boat builders, rig builders, and sail makers. And of course, the design copyright holder, Julian. Julian and and, uh, and it's it's like a teamwork. It's not, maybe in the early days, <laughs> yeah, many sailors got the impression that the, that it's, it's a Julius, Julian is dictating some things, but uh, it's, 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 as my understanding, it's, it's 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 a uh, it's a group of people sailors class association together with the builders and manufacturers they we can we can nowadays quite well talk with each other and it's uh, the, the common common consensus is quite quite nice at the moment so and as, at, le at least at least i feel so when i meet the, meet meet the sailors so of course there's some this i think that the latest Maybe the scandal was a year ago when we had a, some problems with the mainsails. That was a, and some of the top spreaders. But those things have been solved. So I think together with the 
bunch of this, this kind of people, we can solve the problems just talking and communicating. And so the situation is much better than early days, like uh, back in the 1990s when Tina and myself we were sailing the first, fir first four years, I think we had a four different rigs of, of from 96 to 2000. And, and uh, there were no decisions. The rigs, new rigs just came on the market. And, and, and Julian told, told that the old rig, we couldn't make it. We, we couldn't manufacture it anymore. So we just got the new rig. <laughs> and it's, that, wasn't, that was, I would say, far from fair. And now, now that decision making, technical decision making is quite democratic. Thanks very much. Um, well, I, that's it for my questions, and I don't see any coming from the field. You know, I hope um, I'll hand this over to Marcus in a moment. Um, but I, you know, I, I really appreciate Yerky and Tina, both of you. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure the sailors will agree have been able to show how much you know about our class and how much you care for our class. And I think we'll be in really good hands, whichever of you is ultimately selected to be our president. Uh, Marcus, um, would you like to say anything here? And then uh, that's nothing more for me. Yeah, um, well, first of all, thank you, Tina. Thank you, JJ, for uh, this today. I mean, obviously, we're in a very unusual scenario where we have to do it virtually like this. And so I think this was one of our best opportunities to convey your messages out to the, the, the members. Uh, secondly, I think, look, the reality is, Ben, I'm hoping that both of you uh, will continue to work with Ben the way I have worked with him over the last I think eight years now, and I think you know Ben has obviously a huge amount of knowledge in the class uh, in terms of relationships and everything like that. And so I think you know you can both be relatively relaxed, um, given that he knows a huge amount. Thirdly, I'm not going anywhere in the sense that I'm still involved with World Sailing. I'm still involved with the NACRA class. Still involved with Ben uh, on that basis. And it goes without saying, I'm not. You know, it doesn't mean that I suddenly run away. So any kind of questions or anything like that. That's still going to be a big part of it. Um, and I just thank you very much for your time. And Ben, thank you. Um, and what we'll do now is we'll save this, we'll post it, and then there'll be more emails in due course. And uh, it goes without saying good luck to both of you. Um, and the, oh, the, just the, the plan is that the uh, at the AGM, when we get a workout with Ben uh, in terms of what the result is, and then right at the end of the AGM, I'll just do a handover. Uh, for the last few minutes and you guys can take it from there uh, whoever is successful but we'll communicate that to both of you a little bit ahead of the AGM so that you're aware of that um, and other than that Ben I think that's it thank you very much for your time uh, if anybody else has any questions quickly raise your hand but I think that's probably it yep see you guys bye-bye